The Cincinnati Bearcats, what is their overall state of the football roster just less than 100 days away from the start of the 2023 football season? Our Locked On Bearcats, your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's the Friday before Memorial Day weekend. Thank you so much for making Locked On Bearcats your first listen of every day. We are free and available wherever you listen to podcasts, including on YouTube. So don't forget, if you're watching us, to hit that subscribe button and follow us to get an alert every time we drop a new episode. Friday, May 26th, 99 days away from the start of the 2023 football season. Neil Meyer of the front office news joining me today. And Neil, I feel like today is a good day as I've done this week here on Lockdown Bearcats. And I want to get your take on the state, the overall state of the Bearcats roster at the 100 day mark before the season starts. Yeah, man, right now, uh, I think the state of the, uh, the roster is starting to really develop. I mean, Within the last couple of minutes, they add another safety from BYU, graduate transfer George Udo. So that's another big piece in the secondary there. Safety, uh, he's played four years at BYU, so that's a huge addition. Obviously, that's just coming in within the last couple of minutes after the announcement was made on social media. But overall, I think this, I think everyone knows the state of the roster. Obviously, the defense is returning most of the guys from a season ago. I mean, you're returning a defensive line that, uh, concludes Malik Van, uh, Dante Corleone, Jawan Briggs. You throw in Eric Phillips in that mix, who also saw a lot of reps last season. And then that linebacker room, uh, guys we talked about, Dorian Jones, uh, Deshaun Pace. The secondary itself is looking good, too, between Jordan Young, DJ Taylor. Uh, even throw Deshaun uh, Pace there at that star role. I think this team's going to be fun to watch. I think everyone knows that. I think the state of the program is good. I mean, obviously, within the wide receiver room, it's something that's still starting to get some things unfolding here. But obviously, after a season ago where you lost literally your whole offense just about right before the bowl game, outside of Corey Kiner, uh, Chris Scott was your only wide receiver that saw significant action heading to that bowl game. But now they bring in a lot of guys with veteran experience, guys like D. Wiggins, Donovan Ollie, Sterling Burkhalter. And then you have Emory Jones at quarterback with Ben Bryant's uh, new home being up in Chicago at Northwestern. So overall, I think the state of the program's in uh, great hands. So we're about 100 days till kickoff uh, versus East, uh, East Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky on uh, September 2nd. So overall, I- I'm excited for what Scott Satterfield and his company is building up there in Clifton. There's definitely a lot of optimism, at least that I'm feeling. It sounds like you're feeling the same way. And what's really interesting, Neil, and just recently, Dante Corleone was named a second team All-American, preseason All-American by my favorite season preview magazine, Athlon Sports. So that's a major accolade. And he is part of a defensive line that brings back, as you mentioned, a lot of key pieces from last year's team plus Malik Van. And, and what I find fascinating, what I am really fascinating is the strengths of this year's team, I think have been strengths of past Bearcats teams. And it's led to 14 bowl appearances in the last 17 seasons. So is it true that the strengths of the past teams, Neil, are they going to remain strengths in your opinion this year? And when I say strengths, I mean defensive line and running game. You think those are going to do you think those are going to be strengths this year? Yeah, most definitely. That defensive line, it it's going to be tough for teams to run down that throw. Obviously, just with how much experience that team's bringing back. I mean, Jawan Briggs is using his extra year of eligibility. Malik Vans on his 6th year, obviously it wasn't a planned 6th year due to the injury he suffered uh last season, but overall you're looking at this defensive line like 
it, it's going to be a fun time. Brian Brown loves to get to the quarterback. We've seen that all spring. We've seen that in the past at Louisville. Overall, it, it, it's going to be a fun time for the Bearcats on that defensive side, and the run game is going to be very important on the offensive side, in my opinion. No question about it. And I think when I think of a Bearcats offense, their running game has always been their bread and butter. And even on the teams who went 9-1 and one and 13-1, and one, those teams, contrary to what some of you may remember, they were built off of being able to run the football on offense, wear teams down, and get after the quarterback on defense. That is what the identity, in addition to being – offensive line, defensive line, that is what the Bearcats' identity was. They were so stout up front that they were op- that they were able to pave the way for Michael Warren, Jared Dokes, and Jerome Ford. And I look at the running backs on the roster right now, Neil. Corey Kiner, Ryan Montgomery, Miles Montgomery, Stephon Berg, great to see his parents at the day one tour in Columbus last week. I look at the running back room, And I think maybe it's a matter of if these running backs just haven't had the right scheme so far to be able to be really good. Last year, the Bearcats struggled to run the football. I don't think it's I don't think it's an indictment on the running backs themselves. I think Corey Kiner is really good. I'm sure you would agree with me on that. Ryan Montgomery, we know, is really good. They just couldn't run the football up the middle like they did so well. And they're really successful years under Luke Fickle. But maybe, Neil, with a new offensive scheme, that's going to be able to be better this year. At least it better be better this year for this offense to have success and be able to, A, rack up yards, and B, score enough points to win enough games to get to a bowl game. Is, is that where you're at right now with this, with this running game and this offense? Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone knows the running game is going to be – a huge part of the offense this year. Obviously, uh, we talk about the success in the years past. I mean, the 2021 college football playoff run doesn't happen without that offensive line up front with all the returning starters. You were able to run the ball right down their throat. Jerome Ford had 1,300 yards that season, 13 touchdowns. It's impeccable stats to really think about, and it opens up, as you mentioned. Like, if you can get a guy – in a great scheme offensively that where you can run that ball and open things up in the passing game, it's it's huge. And we've seen that in the past. And that was what made that 2021 team so special was Jerome Ford had the breakaway speed. He was able to do all the things well in a running back. And that's why he's going to have a great career in Cleveland, in my opinion. So overall, I mean, if you get that right scheme there offensively uh, to really get those running backs involved. And what's unique about, uh, the running back room here at UC right now be guys like you mentioned, Corey Kiner, Ryan Montgomery, Miles Montgomery, Stephen Bird. They all do different things so well. And that's the thing. Corey Kiner loves loves him some contact. He'll he'll definitely uh, plow somebody over when he needs to. He loves contact. We've seen it uh, throughout his career at Roger Bacon, his one season at LSU, and then his one season here last year. We saw how much he loves contact. But then Ryan Montgomery, you can use in the passing game very well. We've seen what he's able to do out of the backfield in terms of uh, pass catching abilities. He's also a guy who can do a lot of damage on special teams as well. He's one of the best returners in all of the country. So, and then you mentioned guys like Miles Montgomery. Miles Montgomery has had a fantastic spring. He's able, once he gets that full opportunity, I think he's really going to start to turn some heads. We saw what he was able to do, a little bit of flashes of what he could do last season, but. I think right now that backfield is going to be – it's going to be fun to watch. I mean, you got three guys who can do so so many different things. Then you throw Stephen Bird in the mix as well, who's a bigger back, who loves some contact. So, overall, that running back room is going to be special. And it's, it's going to be a huge part of this offense, especially having a dual-threat quarterback uh, controlling the offense and Emory Jones. No question about it. And you, you bring up a great point, the fact that all four running backs that we've mentioned – they can do different things well. I think that's gonna. I think that's gonna be key because it felt like last year, Neil, that and watching the Bearcats last year, the offense wasn't really versatile. It was too predictable, too vanilla. I think this year it's gonna be a little more unpredictable. It's gonna have a, a lot more elements to it. Is that what? Is that what you're hinting at, Neil? Yeah, I think it's gonna be. A, it's it's gonna be a fun offense to watch. I'll say that. And 
I think last year everyone kind of knew what was happening. You knew Josh Wiley, Lenny Taylor, Tyler Scott, Trey Tucker. You, I think teams were starting to get the uh, the schematic there offensively. And we, we saw it in past games. I mean, especially during games where we talk about the defensive line, if they don't have the depth, we saw what happened when Dante Corleone was out versus uh, Tulane. We saw when Malik Van went down, the depth got tested. And obviously on the defensive side, the depth is going to be key up front. But then offensively, you know, it's, I think everyone kind of knew the balls was going to go to Trey Tucker, Tyler Scott, Josh Wiley, Lenny Taylor last year. They brought in Nick Mardner, who was a thousand yard uh, yard guy at Hawaii back in 2021. Everyone kind of, they really utilized him in the red zone mostly, but that was a guy they should have used. In my opinion, I would have loved to see it get a little bit more involved, but things didn't pan out that way. But overall, I think I think that offense is going to be fun to watch this season for sure. I'm excited. I, I really am. And I got a question for you about the wide receivers that I talked that I talked about yesterday. I want to get your opinion on how you view being a UC alum and a Cincinnatian, the wide receiver room this year. But first, I need to tell everybody listening to today's episode how this episode of Lockdown Bearcats is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Neil, I'm not sure if you've heard of Bird Dogs, but these, I, I'm telling you, you could wear this, Neil, I and I and I might too, to cover a football game this year. That is how great these this clothing brand is. So what is Bird Dogs, you ask? Well, if you're if you're a new listener to the show, Bird Dogs are the, are the stretchy fabric that are come here than any other shorts and pants. They give you the freedom to wear one pair of shorts or pants on the golf course to a meeting, a date, or hanging out with friends, or in our case, going to uh, Bearcats sporting events. And if you don't believe me, well, take college football nerds who say they are the perfect pants for dads that have a little extra gut they make them look great and feel comfortable. Bird dog shorts. And then pardon my take coast PFT famously never wears pants. And the only shorts he truly loves are bird dogs. If that's not enough of a testimony for you, I don't know what is. So go to birddogs.com slash locked on college. And when you enter promo code locked on college, they'll throw in a free custom bird dogs. Yeti style tumbler with every order. Bird dogs. Thanks again to all of you who make Locked On Bearcats your first listen every day, free and available wherever you listen to podcasts, including on YouTube, back with Neil Meyer of the Front Office News. Neil, it's really interesting to me when I think about the wide receivers, because first of all, and you and I talked about this after the spring game, I didn't see any egregiously drop passes from a wide receiver at the spring game back in April. And I think to me, yes, it's a weakness right now on the roster. And I think people are concerned because of how good the receiver room has been the last two seasons. But in all honesty, as we touched on already today, the wide receivers room to me, as long as it's, or I'll put it this way. Historically, it's been a supplement and a luxury if the Bearcats have a good wide receiver room. Do you think, and you have followed this, this program for a long time like I have, do you think that the wide receiver room has to, is necessary for this team to get to where they want to go, which I, I think the expectation is a bowl game first year in the Big 12. Do you think they have to be an integral part of the team, or if they're just not bringing it down, that's good? No, absolutely. They have to be a key part of this team, and that's that was one thing Scott Satterfield and the staff did within this offseason after uh, – the departures of Trey Tucker, Tyler Scott to the NFL, then you lose Nick Mardner to Auburn, Drew Donnelly transfers back home to Texas State. I think they went out and they did a great job at getting the guys they did in the portal. In example, they bring D. Wiggins over, who has not only a lot of experience, but he's a big body guy, six foot three, really big frame, can really go up and get it. And then they go out and they bring in a guy like Donovan Ollie from Washington State, who had a fantastic year. I think he hauled in 50 catches, 800 yards, roughly out there. That was the guy that Emory Jones saw up close and personal firsthand within uh, the Pac-12. So, I mean, because obviously they played each other this season uh, at Arizona State. So, I mean, and then you bring in guys like Sterling Burkhalter, who had massive seasons at North Carolina A&T, uh, bring him back home. And then 
if they land Xavier Henderson in the portal, which isn't 100% yet, if they can land him from Florida, I know everyone's seen the speculation going around there. If they can land Xavier Henderson from Florida, uh, that's a, that's another huge addition within the wide receiver room. But everyone knows, you never know with the transfer portal nowadays, but Xavier Henderson is a name that's floating around very frequently within social media to uh, potentially be the next Bearcat wide receiver, but he's still in the portal. So uh, it's another name to keep an eye on for all the Bearcats fans that listen. So if they can land that one, lock that down, I think the wide receiver room will be just fine. I, I, I agree with you that I think it's going to be fine. I'm just, I just think that this offense's identity has to be its ability to run the football. And if the receivers end up being a key part of the team, that's going to be, oh, well, we didn't expect that, but that this is great. It's almost like if they are great, but if not, this team can still be competitive offensively. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think the team will be great offensively. Obviously, the identity, as you mentioned, is to run the football. We all know that, but in order for the team to run the football very well, they're going to have to get the passing game involved too. And once that passing game gets unlocked, we know we know what kind of arm talent Emory Jones has had. We've seen some of the highlights from Florida, Arizona State. We know what Emory Jones is able to do with the football in his hands. However, it's going to be a key. In order to get that run game going, the passing game is going to have to be there too. And honestly, I think this passing game is going to be more involved than people think in year one in the Big 12. It'd be great if it is. Considering that, again, when you think of Big 12 football, you think of air raid offenses. Now, let's transition. We're going to transition to something that I, I, I think is really compelling. And so earlier today, we recorded this, if you're listening to us on this Friday, we recorded this yesterday afternoon. And I'm reading a recent article in The Athletic written by our good friend, David Ubin. So, and all of a sudden, I'll get to that in a minute, but so there is an article that came out recently and David Ubin from The Athletic talked about recruiting in the Big 12 when it comes to, well, Oklahoma and Texas are going to leave. So here's what's interesting. Excluding Texas and Oklahoma recruits, the Big 12 signed only six total five-star prospects in the league's 88 other recruiting classes over the span of 11 years. Now, there's two there's two ways to look at this, Neil. David Ubin's looking at, well, the Big 12 is two major recruiters when it comes to talent, and that boosts the, the conference's overall talent. But I think about Cincinnati come 2024. This conference could really be a level playing field, and that could be an advantage Cincinnati with the recruiting momentum that they have. Do you see it that way? Yeah, it's it's huge momentum for the University of Cincinnati, and I'm glad we're talking about this because this is something Scott Satterfield said just a couple days ago at the groundbreaking press conference of the new indoor practice facilities. And he got, we kind of asked him, we were like, hey, when you bring these recruits on campus, how early in the stages do they see the renderings, the images of what that new practice facility is going to be like when they get to campus? And he said, oh, that's that's the first thing we show them when they get on campus. And that that's huge. Obviously, for many people know, the Bearcats are putting in a $134 million indoor practice facility and health center right there on the corner of Jefferson and Corey Street where the old bubble was. That's massive. That's going to be a massive uh, resource in not just recruiting in the University of Cincinnati Athletics, but that that's going to be huge for the university as a whole because not only is it a state-of-the-art uh, performance center and practice facility, you look back as we talk about the Big 12, TCU's facilities are phenomenal. I had the opportunity to check them out when I was down in Dallas in March. Phenomenal facilities. However, Texas also just got new facilities. They did an $85 million upgrade to some of their uh, facilities. So then I actually asked John Cunningham I, about this uh, new indoor practice facility. I said, hey, have you looked at any of the renderings within the Big 12 with schools like Texas TCU, Oklahoma, as examples, uh, when they were designing this new facility. And he said, 
they wanted to make it their own with the architectural around there. They wanted something that would stand out from others and really pop out when people hit that corner of campus. And how he said it was, this is something they do at UC. It's a special UC way. They wanted to do it their own. And that's what UC is about. And however, that, that's huge for recruiting because if you're, let's talk about it. If you're a 17, 18 year old kid coming to do a recruiting visit and you see a $134 million facility right when you get on campus, you're obviously going to be blown away because there's not many college campuses in uh, all of college with a $135 million practice facility, if we're being honest. So that's huge for recruiting. I think the momentum right now at UC is trending in the most upward direction. Uh, John Cunningham and the athletic department at the University of Cincinnati have done a fantastic job. And Scott Satterfield is thrilled for this new practice facility. I mean, he even has it as his lock screen on his phone, according to John Cunningham. So overall, this is a massive, a massive get for the recruiting class, especially in 2024 uh, when that practice facility is ready. Yeah, good segue, Neil, to a, a really momentous event that took place at, at, at campus this week. I know you were at that ceremony back on Tuesday. Really incredible what's taking place. $134 million practice and performance facility that, as Director of Athletics John Cunningham has said, will be used by all 18 teams. So really, really good stuff there. And what's interesting, Neil, is I don't know if you saw our, our our good buddy Chad Brendel from Bearcat Journal. He tweeted, "Okay, so Bearcats baseball sadly their season comes to an end. They lose to ECU in the conference tournament. Well, that was the last ever competition in the American Athletic Conference. So while we still are 36 days away from being members of the Big 12, it's almost it almost feels like right now we've turned the page." Yeah, no, most definitely. And obviously the we'll enter the Big 12 on July 1st. So we still got about 36 days, as you mentioned, but it, it's huge momentum. Obviously, baseball season ended uh, last night. They fell just short after they had all the momentum there with uh, before the rain delay. So unfortunately, they just couldn't gut it out after a long rain delay. But overall, it's it's huge momentum changing right now. I mean, uh, especially concluding the day one ready tour that you yourself actually were at in Columbus last week. I think right now, like every momentum is just continuing to go upwards. And uh, as they make that transition to the big 12, and I'm glad you mentioned that because this was also a quote that said uh, from John Cunningham, he said, if there aren't cranes around cranes up, you're dying. And he said, there's a lot of cranes up here right now in campus. And that means you're moving in the right direction. And that's huge. That is huge. And he said, if you can move dirt, that means you're moving forward. And they're moving dirt right now up there in Clifton. And they're moving in the very uh, right direction heading into the Big 12. They got all the momentum there behind them. They got the day one ready tour uh, getting ready to wrap up. They still have one more stop in Chicago. They have the day one ready tour campaign. Uh, they have the Cincy Reigns NIL Collective, all the movement behind them and what Brian Fox is doing uh, with the Cincy Reigns. Uh, team, all the momentum is trending in the upwards direction. And it's it's going to take this uh, program to new heights once that officially enter the Big 12 at July 1st. It's unbelievable. It really is. As you say, Neil, and yeah, you mentioned the day one tour last week. I was just going to get there. That's a good segue. So it's really interesting. I said last Friday, Neil, my biggest takeaway from being there was John Cunningham won that night. Because every time I hear him speak, and I think – Based on what you based on what you say, I think you feel the same way. Every time you hear him speak, he's giving you more and more of what he wants to do to this university. It's unbelievable. He details a story of how prepared he and Dr. Pinto, President Neville Pinto, were when they went down to be with then Big 12 Commissioner Bob Bowlesby. And they prepared for a whole week and they got there and they got the invitation without even having to present what they prepared. But it speaks to how John Cunningham is going to do everything in his willpower to get this university and this athletic program to where it can go. And if you would have told me that this is where it would be three and a half years after he got hired with a global pandemic that ensued less than three months after he was hired, I'm not sure if I would have believed you, but I like the results that we're getting right now. And speaking of that, Neil, 
So at the day one tour, which by the way, three of the five coaches were on hand are John Cunningham hires, Scott Satterfield, Wes Miller, and Katrina Merriweather. The other two, Molly Alvey and Mandy Commons DeSale, are wildly successful with women's volleyball and swimming and diving. So, Neil, it's interesting, as all five coaches are in a Q&A with Dan Horde, Wes Miller gets a phone call. I think we maybe know what that phone call was. We'll get to that after or next here on Locked On Bearcats. So, Neil, I don't know if this was the exact phone call. I haven't obtained phone records just yet. But maybe, just maybe, that phone call was from Aziz Bandego. And ultimately, Neil Meyer, he transfers to the University of Cincinnati. What was your reaction, and how much does he raise the expectations for this program heading into their first Big 12 season? Yeah, my my uh, reaction was, that's huge. Everyone saw what Aziz Mandego was able to do in Utah Valley State's win over the Bearcats. He finished with 15 points, 12 rebounds, four blocks. That's, that's what you want as a big. And you look down at what, first of all, Aziz has had a tremendous transformation from year one at Arkansas to where he is now here at Cincinnati. I mean, he transferred, he started his career at Arkansas, transferred to Utah Valley State. And then now he went from a guy playing just four minutes his freshman year to putting up literally 12 and 10 every night, roughly. And then you add three, four block shots there as well. I think he averaged three blocks a game. That's huge. That is huge. And then you pair him alongside with guys like Jamil Reynolds, Victor Lockin, Odio Guama. This, this is probably the biggest front court the Bearcats have had in recent years, if we're being honest. And you look down, I mean, the thing I'm most excited for with Aziz and Jamil is how they will be developed under Mike Roberts. Mike Roberts handles most of the big men here at UC within the basketball program. He's done a fantastic job. We saw the development with Odia Guama, Victor Lockin. And now it not only provides depth within the front court, it provides physicality. I know they've talked about in press conferences wanting to extend Vic's range. If he can get that mid-range jumper down, they've talked about extend, expanding his range. I mean, if you can get that to happen here this offseason, that's huge for the Bearcats. And I think right now you you look down on paper and you, you could insert any of these guys in there, whether it's at the four or the five, and it's Odie, Vic, Aziz, and Jamil. You look down on paper and you see four seven-footers who can all do different things very well. And I'll tell you right now, I saw Jamil Reynolds down in uh, Dallas. I passed him on the street during the AAC tournament. He is every bit of that six foot ten, six foot eleven in two hundred eighty five pound frame. Every bit of it. That boy is pure muscle. We saw what he was able to do at Temple. He loves to play some bully ball inside. It's going to be a fun time for those bigs. And it starts with Jamil Reynolds. Aziz Mandego, Victor Locke, and Odi Guama. Like, those four right there, especially within the Big 12, we see how important bigs are within the front court. And especially heading into the Big 12, the best basketball conference in all of college basketball, it's huge to have four solid bigs like that. Four solid bigs, especially when you think about historically Cincinnati Bearcats basketball. They've had so many great physical big men over the years. It just hasn't really been that way recently. But as I look at the Big 12 last year, Neil, and all 10 teams, basically what I took away was that it is a season of streaks. You know, Baylor lost their first three games, then won six, and then concluded the regular season losing two, winning two, and then losing two again. And then you look at some other teams in the Big 12. You look at Iowa State had both four winning and losing streaks in the same season. Kansas State had two four-game winning streaks. Oklahoma State won five, then lost five. Texas Tech lost eight, then won four, and suddenly they're back in the NCAA tournament conversation. West Virginia made the NCAA tournament winning, losing five and three games at two different points in the season. So what I'm getting at it here, Neil, is it feels like every team is on a level playing field in terms of the gauntlet you're going to have to run through in the Big 12. Is that accurate? 
Yeah, that that is absolutely accurate. And we mentioned West Virginia there too. And it's important we hit on this when we talk about the gauntlet of the Big 12. West Virginia started 0-8 in conference play and still made the NCAA tournament, especially within the Big 12. That is huge. And that shows the playing field there within the Big 12. I mean, Texas Tech had a great run there to end the season. They just fell just short of the bubble. And then we talk about West Virginia. They had a, a very slow start. And then I think once the the hiring of DeMar Johnson came out there, that's when that program really flipped the switch. I mean, DeMar was here at UC under Coach Miller. And once he got out to West Virginia, that flipped that program around. And But now you talk about the Big 12. You look down, Texas Tech is always a good basketball team. Baylor's been a great basketball team. You still have Texas and Oklahoma for a year. Kansas is a, a blue blood. Kansas is going to be a top five team, arguably, to start the season, hopefully. And then you look down Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Baylor, Iowa State. It's it's just about an even playing field all the way across. And it's one of it's what makes that basketball conference so special and arguably the best basketball conference in all of college basketball is it's not up for like you don't have an early favorite, like a lead runaway. Like, yeah, Kansas is the blue bud, but you're looking down at paper, Big 12 basketball. Is up for grabs for anybody at all times. And it's once that ball tips off, you will see that. It's an even playing field. It's a, one of the most fun basketball conferences in all of college basketball. And you're in for a showdown every night. You, it's not like these teams are expected to blow teams out by 20 every night, uh, as some games were within the AAC. So, I mean, you're looking down at it. It's, it's going to be a battle every night within the Big 12 on all – all things cylinder wise. Get ready. I'm just going to say, get ready. Cause there's going to be some wild nights in this conference. Now I'm going to tease ahead to next Monday's episode, Neil. I'm not sure if you've, I'm sure you have given that you cover the team. Like I do, you've been on Twitter and you're seeing these reports that are coming down on former director of athletics at the university, at the university of Cincinnati, Mike bone. And the headline in an article in The Athletic written by Justin Williams and more says, inside a toxic atmosphere at Cincinnati, what USC didn't know before hiring AD Mike Bone. I haven't read it yet. I just saw this as we were recording this, but sounds like there is a some major, this is a major story that could leak in the next week. Have you heard anything about what's maybe transpired under the Bone regime at Cincinnati? I have not heard anything. Uh, no, so I haven't heard anything. Okay. I haven't even read the article yet myself, so I'll have to do that later today or over the weekend, but I have not heard anything of it, unfortunately, now. All right. Well, tease ahead potentially to next week. We, that could be a talking point as we transition into the true offseason. I mean, there. I mean, look, the athletic season, aside from those still remaining in college baseball, it's effectively over at the University of Cincinnati. So we're truly into the summer months, but – we're still going to be with you on Lockdown Bearcats. I don't know if it's five days a week or three days a week next week. If it's three, that means we go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. If it's five days a week, well, you know the drill, how that works. So we'll 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 continue to be with you. Neil, I'm sure you'll be making appearances throughout the summer. And uh, we will look forward to talking to you next week. You, you take care of yourself and uh, enjoy what should be a fantastic weather weekend for Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, you as well, Alex. I appreciate you having me on. As always, it's a great time and uh, really looking forward to what this uh, next episode of Locked on Bearcats presents. Yes, thank you. Neil Meyer from the front office news at Neil Meyer 6 on Twitter. That's going to do it for me today here on Locked on Bearcats. Hope you have yourself a fantastic Memorial Day weekend. Enjoy the Indy 500. Enjoy the warm weather. Enjoy pools opening. Um, hopefully, somewhere around the, the Cincinnati, Central Ohio, the Tri-State. So uh, looking forward to that, looking forward to um, just continuing throughout the summer. I don't, I don't even know, like, see, I live in Oakwood, suburb of Dayton. I don't know where, like, the nearest community pool is even. I don't know if we have one in our neighborhood or, you know, Dayton Country Club and NCR. I don't even know if NCR is one, but uh, – Hopefully those will be opening up soon. So looking forward to the summer months right here on Lockdown Bearcats. I'm on Twitter at Frankie underscore Natty, two N's and an A-T-I. Instagram, Alex Frank, not underscore. And then email, 
alex3frank at gmail.com. Have a great weekend. 99 days away from the season opener, 36 days away from being members of the Big 12. I'm Alex Frank for Locked On Bearcats. I don't know if I didn't look this up before the show today, if we have any birthdays within the Bearcats community. Let's see if we do. On this Friday, May 26th, oops, let's see if we do. For football, let's see, it looks like I am not seeing anything on football reference. If there are any birthdays from the Bearcats community, let's see, it looks like there is not... We'll check basketball. Make sure that we didn't miss anything there. And we did not. That's going to do it for me today. Have a great, great weekend. I'm back on Monday here in Lockdown Bearcats, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.